All right, well, this evening, uh, we are going to talk about two Hebrew letters. Uh, we're going to talk about the Hebrew letter Zion, and a little bit about Chet, and we're going to talk about Tet. And many of you know that uh, over the last year, I've been sporadically going through the Hebrew alphabet and going back to the original Paleo-Hebrew and showing you what it looked like in ancient Israel 4,000 years ago and what it means. Every single Hebrew letter has a picture, and it also is a number. And if you go back in time and you look at the Hebrew uh, Torah, you look at the Torah or the Hebrew Scriptures, and you see the Hebrew letters, originally they weren't in the modern day what they call squ square script. They were in picture format, just like you would be familiar with uh, ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. And so they would see pictures, and they would also see numbers built into those pictures. And so every Hebrew word that's made up of Hebrew letters has pictures and a story built into it. So it's absolutely phenomenal because our God is so smart that there are multiple stories built into each and every letter and word in your Bible. And so we're just going to talk about one of those here this evening, uh, starting off with the letter Zion. And I think that this will be a blessing to you, no matter where you're at in your spiritual journey. This is kind of, uh, you know, in a way, uh, collegiate uh, material. I don't think they go even through Paleo-Hebrew in seminary. Um, but we're going to get into both the spirit and the truth tonight. Because how many believe that if we actually get into the black and white letters... That the white behind it, the ancient rabbis called it the white fire, because if you think about it, if you picture it as white fire, all the white on your, on your pages of your Bible, that is actually the spirit of the living God. Do you know why it has to be white? Why can't it be black? Because you wouldn't see it. You see, the actual black letters that are in your Bibles mean nothing without the contrast of the spirit or the ruach. If you remove the ruach, the spirit, from the actual letter, it's void. It's blackness. In the beginning was what? The word. But what was in the beginning? It was dark and the earth was formless and void. There was no contrast. So what we're going to do is we're going to open up the scriptures. We're going to show you right now, you're looking at the letter Zion. Everybody say Zion. An actual pronunciation, the I is always E, so it's Zion. Zion. But in modern Hebrew, it's called Zion. So we're going to show you the contrast tonight of what it really means. Let's talk about the, the, uh, the evolution of Zion. How does this work here? Do I swipe it? How cool is that? I am in love. All right. The evolution of Zion, if there's any evolution that's true, it would certainly be about letters over time. It is the seventh letter in the Hebrew alphabet, okay? And matter of fact, before we go any further, let me swipe this one more time. And this is your Hebrew alphabet from the very beginning. And uh, if I figured out how to go to the end, I would be able to do that. But in any case, it starts off with Aleph. So for those of you that, that weren't here for uh, that series uh, or the previous teachings on the Aleph Bet, uh, let me just catch you up in, in, in a 30-second montage. It starts off with Aleph, and Aleph is an ox head or strength. It means leader, the strength of the leader. Bet, it means house or tent or opening to the house, okay? And uh, Gimel is a foot or camel or pride. It's the rich man, the generous rich man in a good way. And Dalit is a door, okay? Dalit is an open door. Matter of fact, it looks like in, in, in modern Hebrew, a door frame that is missing one side. Why? Because it's an open door. The rich man gives generously to the poor man or the open door. And then Hay looks just like this. It's my favorite letter. It's a guy jumping up and down, and it means revelation, okay? Or behold, exciting things are happening. Revelation has come. Vav is a nail or a hook, okay? And that brings us to Zion. And so the Hebrew alphabet is a story of your life, and it's a spiritual journey. And one of these days, I will, I'm going to write a book about this because I believe that everything that happens in the universe happens because of this 26 letters, okay? Because of the, excuse me, because of these 22 letters, because, I'm still used to that English alphabet. Because of these letters that you are looking at right now, the entire universe was created. You are looking at the word of Yahweh. Do you know how many strands of DNA you have? The same exact amount as the Hebrew alphabet. Did you know that? 
Everything is about the Hebrew letters. And so what I believe is that as we go through here, you can see where you're at in your spiritual journey. And if there's something wrong that's catching you up, you're going to see where the problem is because you'll see the antithesis of whatever letter that you are stuck on. And it'll tell you how to get to the next letter. Here's what I mean. The first one is Aleph, which is the leader. So where we're at is the leader of the house is the rich man that opens the door to revelation of the nail. And who is that? Yeshua. So let's find out what Zion means. We'll go back to the evolution of Zion where it's gematria is seven. Seven is the number perf- of, of perfection. You know that. We'll talk about that in just a moment. In pictograph form, 4,000 years ago is a form of a plow. We'll talk about that. In Ketav Ivri, Paleo Hebrew, kind of like a I, if you will, in English. And then in classical Hebrew, you can see what it looks like. And then today in modern Hebrew, now classical Hebrew is what Yeshua would have used, maybe minus the crowns, okay? If you've never heard the word Yeshua, that is simply the Hebrew name for our Messiah, Jesus, okay? Jesus is a transliteration name from the Greek, Isus, and Isus is a transliteration of Yeshua. So uh, when, when he comes back, I can assure you, we'll be saying his real name, Okay? Everyone likes to be called by his real name. So if you hear me say that, and this is your first time, that's why. Okay, here is the meaning of Zion. Zion is a weapon or a sword, and it's also a plow. Now, my question to you is, how on earth is that possible? How on earth can it be? I mean, those are diametrically, it seems like, opposite ends of the spectrum. A sword and a plow. One seems to be good, one seems to be bad. Well, as we dig into the scriptures a little bit, I think what you're going to discover is that they actually work in tandem together. They work with one another. It is the rule and the universe of Yahweh is that he digs into us deep. Sometimes it uses a sword. In modern Hebrew, it simply means to be uh, prepared for war, to be armed, okay? In a way, to be armed and dangerous. How many know in the scriptures in the Brit HaDashah, the New Testament, when it talks about uh, the armor of God, Okay, that's referring to the letter Zion. So here, let's talk about Zion and what what it really is. If we go back one letter to the letter Vav, which you see there on your left, that's the letter Vav, that's the nail, that's the hook, okay? Yeshua is the nail, happens to be the, the number six, which is the number of man. Yeshua was nailed, okay? It is actually a crowned vav. Zion is nothing other than a crowned vav. What does that mean? That means it is Yeshua in his final state of perfection with his crown. It is the king. It is the fullness of the sword, if you will, which makes sense why it's the seventh letter. It's perfection. It's the perfect vav, if you will. Bear with me. This will all begin to come together. The Bel Shem Tov which is just an ancient, an ancient, it's an old uh, rabbi said this in 1760, just as a woman of valor is the crown of her husband, so Zion, the seventh letter, is the crown of Vav. This is phenomenal because a husband is what? A man. Man, the number of man is what? Six connected to Vav. Zion is the number seven. A woman is the crown of her husband. Now, the next question that I know all you men are saying is, does that mean my wife is perfect? Yes, you're the only thing preventing her from being perfect, right? (laughs) I've been married for 15 years, I can say that. Proverbs chapter 12, verse four says this, a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh ashamed is rottenness to his bones. Let me say that again, because I'm always picking on the guys here. You guys know that. I love families, and I love marriage, and I love teaching. Shalom in the home, and all of those good things. But the reality is, is that the, a woman who fears Yahweh and keeps his commandments is a crown to her husband. She is representing Zion, the perfect sword and plow, which we'll talk about in just a moment, the crown of Yeshua, we talked about the, the Ark of the Covenant uh, in the past. And the bottom, the actual Ark, is male in Hebrew. 
its gender is male. The seat that sits on top of the Ark of the Covenant is feminine. Mercy seat, mercy triumphs over judgment. It's the commandments that are inside the thing, the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. The woman crowns her husband with mercy. But if she is not following the Father and she is not in covenant, she will make his bones like completely rotten. There's a whole message that could be said there. Zion, the number seven, it's the number of perfection. It's a sword and a plow. Because it's the number seven, anyone that knows anything about the front of the book and all the Hebrew that surrounds it will immediately think of this. It's a Shabbat. Zion is connected to today. Zion is connected to Shabbat, the Sabbath. Why? Because the Sabbath is the seventh day. God in the, in the garden gave the commandments. What did he do? On the, on the, for six days he created the entire heaven and the earth. And on the seventh day he did what? He rested. He created the commandment of the Sabbath before man fell. Which means that if man would have never fell, guess what was happening? We'd be doing every seventh day. Resting. Because that was the commandment. The Shabbat is such an amazing time of reflection and rest for our families and recalibration and focusing on the Creator and our wives and our children, our loved ones, our personal walks. It's a time where world stops and we remember what it would have been like in the garden to be obedient and to rest with our Savior arm in arm and hand in hand. It's taking yourself out of the world of time. And saying, forget what everybody else says I should be doing. Forget our society and the way that it works. And this is when everybody does this and everybody does this. This is my time with the Father. I'm going to sit in paradise. I'm going to be in his word and so on and so forth. Zion, the plow and the sword is connected to the Shabbat. As you know, the Vav is the number six. It's a number of man. And it's a nail or hook, as I mentioned. So what are some of the connections that we can make from this? First of all, Vav represents man and nail. Zion represents the sword. Yeshua represents all men by dying for men with the nail, number six, the Vav, and thus bringing us the sword of the Spirit. So there's a connection between Vav and between Zion, between Yeshua and the nail and the sword and the Spirit. You cannot have one without the other. He is truly the crowned nail. Now, here's even some more uh, amazing uh, gematria for you. How many recognize that, you know, that you've heard about the Bible codes and all that stuff, right? Well, it's actually real in Hebrew. Every letter has a number. And it should not surprise you that your God is so huge, so big, and so smart that if we actually knew the Hebrew the way that he knows it, We could look, and if we had his knowledge, we could see the numerical connections between all these different words. So if you had infinite knowledge of his word, this is what's going to happen. When you you die and judgment day comes and he lets you in, if the Father has so graced us to understand his word in a phenomenal way, what's going to happen is you're going to open up his word and you're going to see the word, you're going to see a word like binah, which means understanding, and it's gematria 67, and you're instantly going to think Vav and Zion. There's a connection here between the Messiah and man and resurrection power. And then you're going to think of 50 other words that had the same exact gematria of 67. And guess what? They're all going to be related. Mathematically impossible. But with God, he's so smart that when he created the languages, they transcend understanding and even numbers. They all mean things. So Vav is six. Zion is seven. You have the nail, and you have the plow, and you have the sword, and those two numbers together mean understanding. What does this mean? What am I saying? When you have Yeshua, the nail, Jesus the Christ, and you truly understand who he is, that crowns you to the next level to have the ability to have the sword of the Spirit. It is only when you have the sword of the Spirit with the crown of the nail that you have understanding. No one can understand the Scriptures, the Bible says, unless God opens his eyes through the Spirit that draws him. This is why Vav must come before Zion. Because there's only one way. You see what I'm saying? There's only one way 
to the end of the alphabet, and it starts with Aleph. Does it, does it, does it surprise you that Aleph is the head? And Aleph bet together, the two letters of means father. You must start at the head, the very beginning, the father, which sent the open door. The rich man that opened the door that brought revelation of the nail that brings the sword of the spirit. It all goes in order. Zion. Zion brings life through death. This is the, the uh, kind of the paradox of spirituality in our walk, is we do not understand this because we are Americans. Americans do not like death. We don't even like to get a, a hangnail without complaining. We don't understand suffering. Who has ever memorized the scripture that said that even Yeshua learned obedience through suffering? Some of you say that's not in the Bible. Yes, it is. This is how you learn obedience is through suffering. It's far removed from our culture because we are fat aristocrats. I don't care what, even if you live in the poverty line, it doesn't matter. Zion brings life through death and nourishment through the sword. It breaks up ground for the purpose of bringing forth seed. And cuts deep into the soul to cut out what is not of him so that new life may sprout. The sword of the Spirit's job is to go deep inside of you and hurt you. You say, are you saying that God is here to hurt me? The part of you that's not of him needs to be killed. I'm sorry. Get over it. What has been growing inside of you that is not of him is not you. It's not the real you. It's not the destined you. It needs to be destroyed. It needs to be killed. It needs to hurt until you bend the knee. Because most of us want what we want. Let's just be honest. We want to go to church where we want to go to church. We want to go to church with the same kind of people that we go to church with. And they're going to say what we want to hear, right? Preferably a place that doesn't take an offering. We want, we want what we want. Listen, we, when we're hungry, what do we do? Do we go eat what our neighbor wants to eat? We eat what we want to eat. How many have come home and asked your, your wife, honey, what's for dinner? And she says tacos, and you just had tacos for lunch. The last thing that you want is tacos, so you smile if you're smart. <laughs> we want what we want because we're Americans, we have no concept of authority or kingdom authority or government. Some of you look at me like a deer in headlights because you don't even know what I'm saying. I had someone that, that, that is coming in for an interview for a video position here at PFT. And he was, he's in the Navy. And he sent me an email that impacted me greatly, explaining to me, he said, Jim, I have a difficult time in calling you Jim because I come from the Navy. This is against the law. This is against everything in my DNA to call you by your first name because I don't call admirals by their first name. I don't call generals by their first name. I would never, no matter what I think about the president, I would never call him by his first name because I honor the position and I recognize the position. I understand authority and I understand government. And I thought, wow. He was preaching to me. I hadn't even hired him yet. I thought, I should not be hiring him for a video position. I should be hiring him for a, a preacher. And give me a week off every once in a while. But the point is this. Until we understand that there are two kingdoms in this world, one is owned by Satan, Hasatan. He is the God of this world. Yahweh has no legal right in this earth realm, according to the Bible. Did you know that? The second that Adam gave the keys over, see, the authority was given to Adam, and Adam blew it. He gave the authority to Hasatan, which is what he wanted from the very beginning. He wanted to rise above. He knew he had no right. Satan had no right. The serpent had no right to Adam and Eve. He had no authority over them. The only way he could get authority is if Adam would give him the authority. And the moment he would do it, it's like any Hollywood movie. When the ring goes on, he owns them. 
The transfer of government went from Yahweh. Have you ever wondered why Yahweh had to leave the garden? Are you kidding me? He created the garden. Why not make Adam and Eve get out? And ultimately he did, but why would he have to leave? Isn't it his earth? He didn't have right. Adam kicked his own creator out of the garden because he gave the authority to another God. And that God rules this world. And if you're not in covenant with him, like I was sharing with someone this afternoon, if you're not in covenant with him the way that he desires, then he has no right to heal your body, no right to heal and to answer your prayers. He has no legal right. Everything in the Bible is legal. Whether you like it or not, it's legal. This is why Yeshua walked along the earth and he cast demons out and he didn't destroy them. Wouldn't it be more logical just to kind of destroy them, like annihilate, get rid of? Why just like push them off so seven, and he says seven times they might come back, you know. Well, wait a minute, if I'm the disciple, I'm going, now wait a minute, you're the son of the living God. I mean, what what do you mean they could come back? He had no legal right. It's only when he comes back as king that they get thrown into the lake of fire and are destroyed at the end of the thousand year rule, you see. So we have got to come to a point where we understand the sword of the spirit is designed for transfer of government. You may have been salvifically in your salvation transferred of government. And you might be in covenant with the creator. But did you know that you can be in bondage and have nothing of blessing except for salvation? And you will be sorely disappointed on judgment day if all you get is to live in paradise. Because it will be nothing like what you think. There is such thing as least in the kingdom of heaven. You don't want to be least. You might say, well, all I want to do is get there. Then, brother, you should be begging for mercy because that is the wrong attitude. We should be wanting to fulfill his heart and his dreams and serve him with everything inside of us. And we should be shooting to serve him to such a degree that he would say, good job. You are the greatest in the kingdom of heaven because you served me at the least of levels. That was a tangent. Let's, let's move on. I only got three hours left. <laughs> Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. Let's read a little scripture. It says it a lot better than I can. Think not that I've come to spend, excuse me, send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Ephesians 6, 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of Elohim. Let me ask you a question. When this was written in Ephesians, to the Ephesians, the ecclesia, the assembly in Ephesians, what is the word of God? There is no New Testament. The letters are barely tossed around from Paul. And I can guarantee you Paul did not think that he was writing the word of God. Is it? Absolutely. Divinely inspired. But to them, the word of God was what we call the old done away with testament. That they said was all scripture is God breathed and worthy of instruction and righteousness and the way of life. The very value that they put on what we call the Old Testament to them was the scriptures. It was the only way to live. It was the word of God. How far have we fallen today that in, 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 in what's called Christianity today, we don't even see any value in the Word of God. If you devalue any part of the Word of God and take away or add to it, what does the Bible say? There's a curse. Now, it may not be your salvation that's cursed, but there will be bondage and there'll be a restriction in your spiritual life because you cannot have legal access to the Father when you're out of covenant in any area. The moment that you decide to fornicate, watch pornography, cheat on your spouse, get get drunk, so on and so forth, whatever, have a bad thought, the moment that you break your covenant, you allow the legal right of the enemy legal rights to you in that area. You want to get rid of the enemy in your life? Transfer the government. Repent, faith, and obedience. 
Don't expect the creator to listen to your prayers while you're out of covenant in an area. Does that make any sense? Okay, Okay, good. Hebrews chapter 4, for the word of God is quick, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged Zion. Piercing even to the dividing asunder. Take the Zion, remember what it looked like? Put your hand over the two sides on top. What do you have? You have a dagger, you have a sword. Sharper than any two-edged Zion, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit of the joints and the marrow, and a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The spirit knows your true motivation for even being here tonight or not being here for those of you that are not here. The spirit is convicting you right now and you will turn on the the stream right now. (laughs) Welcome to Passion for Truth. We've been waiting for you. Here's some words that start with Zion. Go figure Zion means weapon or sword. Zman means time. Check this out. Zacher, remember. Zacharon, remembrance. Zacharon, memorial. Zamam, think or consider. Anybody see any connections? A, a, a proverbial theme going on here. Something about remembering, something on time, something to do with thinking or considering. Deuteronomy chapter 5, right before the Shema we just read. And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out there by a mighty hand and outstretched arm. Therefore, Yahweh your Elohim commanded you to keep the Shabbat, holy, kadosh, set apart from all other days. Remember, keep the Sabbath holy. Connected to Zion. How about these words here? This is interesting. Zana, which means to fornicate. Zavav, buzz. Zavuv, fly. And zana is whore. Wow, have we hit the other end of the spectrum here on words that, that, that start with Zion or Zion. Why is there such a dramatic, when you look at all the words that start with Z, with Zion, it's incredible. They fall on one side or the other. There's virtually nothing in between. What is the creator trying to say? What is the hint that he's trying to give that the letter Zion is connected to? What did I just read? I just read to you Deuteronomy chapter 5 about remembering, remembering, remembering. Do a research on the word remember and guess what you're going to find? It's phenomenal. If what Yahweh wants you to remember over and over and over again, look it up, don't take my word for it. Never take my word for it. I can be in the flesh at any time. So look it up for yourself. But when you do research on remember, if you're married, this is the number one thing your wife wants from you, just to remember. Amen, ladies? It's the worst thing that we are good at. (laughs) You're always the same way. What he wants us to do is remember his commandments and to keep his Shabbat holy. Why? Because that's what broke us out of the garden to begin with, was not remembering. So what does this have to do with these words in this side? Watch this, Exodus 20, verse 13. Yet the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness, and they greatly defiled my Sabbath. Then I said I would pour out my fury on them in the wilderness to consume them. In verse 16, because they despised my judgments and did not walk in my statutes, but profaned my Sabbath, for their heart went after other idols. Because they had not executed my judgments, but had despised my statutes, profaned my Sabbath, and their eyes were fixed on other idols. In verse 20, or chapter 22 of Ezekiel, verse 26 says, her priests have violated my law. Think of those words. Whore. Fornicated, buzz, fly. They profaned my holy things. They have not distinguished between the holy, listen to this verse, one of the most powerful, unpreached verses in the entire Bible. Her priest, this is prophetically talking about the end of time, by the way, profaned and violated my Torah, is what it is in Hebrew, and profaned my holy things. They have not distinguished between the holy And the unholy. They don't even know what the difference is. Sound familiar? 
Walk to any church in America and ask any Christian coming out the door, name one thing that's holy and one thing that's unholy in the Bible. We don't even know because we're not taught. We have no idea what's holy and unholy to him because we say, oh, it really doesn't matter as if we're the ones that make the definitions up. Nor have they made known the difference between the unclean and the clean. What's the difference between holy and unholy and clean and unclean? Do we even know that difference, much less naming an object? They have hidden their eyes from my Shabbats. My anniversaries is what it is. Gentlemen, Hide your eyes from your wife's birthday or anniversary and see what happens. See if you don't find the holy backyard. (laughs) Listen, and they have hidden their eyes from my Sabbath so that I am profaned among them. Do you know what the word profane is in Hebrew? What it means? To be made common. See, we think of it as profanity, don't we? Because that's where the Puritans came in and they, they changed it. It does not mean profanity. It means to be made common. You have fine china in my house. Uh, it's finest that you can buy at Target. And uh, we use it on Shabbat with our wine glasses that hold our grape juice. We do not put cat food in those bowls and on those plates. They are set aside. In Hebrew, that is kadosh. They're holy. They're not common, okay? The moment that we take those regular plates and we start using them for macaroni and cheese, they're not special anymore. They're common. So what we have done in other scriptures, if you know your Bible, is this is what we've done. The creator says, here's my rules. Here's my vav. Here's my Zion. Do things my way. The sword will penetrate you. It'll pull out who you really are. You will wake up a new man, a new Adam, new blood, divinely inspired, and you will walk in my ways, and you will be healed from all the diseases of the Gentiles. And what we've done is we have refused refused to follow him in his ways. We don't even know what clean and unclean is. We don't even know what holy and unholy is. And so we defile his Sabbath because we've been taught that they're done away with. We don't know anything about them. And then we wonder why we walk in all of the the, the hurt and the pain and the suffering and the the, the defiled bodies that we have. What we've done, ladies and gentlemen, we've taken the holy God who makes all the rules and we've said, you know what? The same thing the serpent said in the garden, that he didn't really mean those and we bring him down to our level because we're the ones making the rules now and we've profaned the God that we say we serve. We've made him common, ladies and gentlemen. He's not God anymore. He's one of us. The very thing that Hasitan tried to do 6,000 years ago was want to be God, take God and bring him down here so that he could elevate himself over Elohim and that we've never stopped since because we are in the kingdom realm of Hasitan. We are listening to his voice and we are doing what he says we should do, which is to bring God down to our level and God didn't really mean that. You stand before the living God and tell him that he did not mean what he said. When he said a pig is unclean, it's unclean. Jesus didn't make a clean pig on the cross. It's toxic. He created it to vacuum the earth. I don't care if you like ham. I love ham. I just don't eat it anymore because it's unclean. I don't have the right to look into my father's eyes and tell him that what his word says is not what it says. It never changes. It's the same today, yesterday, and forever. Amen? It is man that has misunderstood what Paul is trying to say in the New Testament because we refuse to read the front of the book that Paul had memorized word for word. And by the way, his name was not Paul, it was Shaul. How many grew up learning or believing that Paul's name was changed from Saul to Paul? How far have we fallen? Saul was just his Hebrew name. Paulos was his Greek name. It wasn't changed. He was a rabbi on top of that. Whenever you look at the Torah and you see an elevated letter, it means there is something significant that, that, that the author is trying to show. 
because you don't get elevated letters very often in the Torah. And so in Malachi chapter 4, verse 4, you see an elevated Zion standing at the beginning of the word. And guess what word it is? Remember the Torah of Moshe, my servant, that I commanded him at Mount Horeb. The statutes, the chukim, and the judgments, mishpatim, for all Israel. He's saying, remember. It is basically, it is an annotation from the author that says, you better pay attention to what I'm getting ready to say. What does he want you to remember? You see, we're taught in American culture that fences and laws are bad. Do you know how many new laws were created in the United States as of January 1st? 4,000. God only has 613. Do you know how many are on the books right now? Over 40,000 laws in the United States right now. And you are proud to be a citizen. So far. Yet we loathe just 600. And most of them don't even apply. Because we don't live in the land of Israel or you're not a man, or you're not a woman, or you're not a priest. We don't even, we refuse to even look at them. We fall right into Ezekiel chapter 22. This is us, end of time, before the Messiah comes. That's the context of this scripture. Ladies and gentlemen, we better wake up, and we better start going back to the front of the book and find out what it says. Because I don't know about you, but I want to be approved on judgment day. I don't want him to say, wait a minute, I gave you the entire book. Why didn't you believe me? Well, because my pastor said that I didn't have to do the front of the book because it's, it's uh, old, isn't it? Well, the news 2,000 years old and we believe in it. It's not so new anymore. We're being deceived. Some of you are not sure exactly what I'm saying here. That's okay. Hear the Spirit, what He's saying to you. Look at this. Life comes through sowing the right seed. The job of the Zion is to go into the ground. What do plows do? They go into the ground, and what do they do? They break open the soil into two sections, do they not? What is that doing? It's breaking open the heart of a man into two quadrants. Did you know your heart is divided into four different quadrants, but two halves? The heart, when you say I have a broken heart, anybody ever see a picture, clip art of a broken heart? It's never in four or five pieces. It's one right down the middle. And if you look very careful, I wish I'd have had this on the the screen, it looks like two tablets of stone. And that's what happened when we kicked God out. See, it's ironic how we're trying to get the Ten Commandments back into the schools and back into the the, the judicial system, but we really don't even believe in the fourth one. We don't believe in them anymore. We We don't walk in his power because we don't believe in the Zion. What is the Zion? It's the sword of the Spirit, the word of Yahweh, the Torah, it says, and ancient sages will tell you this, the Torah goes deep inside of a man when he believes in it. When he believe, what Torah means, for those of you who don't know in, in English, is instructions. It does not mean law. It means instructions, okay? It can be translated law, but it mainly means instructions, boundaries, guidelines, fences. Build your house on the side of a cliff, have four kids, and not put up a fence. You're a fool. Fences are there to protect us. That's why he said, don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Is he just a mean God? No, he loves us. When you allow his spirit to dig inside of you, some of you husbands, need your, you need to listen to your wives because they are the spirit, they are the mercy seat, they are your crown that's watching out for your back because nobody else really cares about your back. Because no one will tell you that your fly is down except for your wife and those that are close to you. Everyone else laughs. And you guys laugh because you know it's true. Your wife's the only one that comes up and gives you a hug and says, honey, you need to go back to her right now. None of your guy friends are going to come up and give you a hug and tell you to go to the bathroom. And if they do, walk away. (laughs) Quickly. Listen, when you see the next letter, this is all going to make sense. 
Because when the sword comes in and the plow comes in, its job is not to make you comfortable. If you're comfortable right now, you should be really uncomfortable. Because the sword will open up. That's what people do. That's what spouses do. They open up your heart to show you what's inside of it that you don't want to see. Now, they may not do it the right way. They might not do it with the right sword of the Spirit. But nevertheless, that's what our job is as fellow Mishpachah members, fellow family members in a covenant of a congregation, is to open each other up. When you open each other up, truly, it creates two sides. That's this letter. The very next letter is Chet. And what is Het? Het is a fence. I already taught on this, so I'm not going to go into it very deeply. But it is a fence that separates two sides. When you picture the Ark of the Covenant, you picture the, the tabernacle of Moses. What is around the tabernacle of Moses? A fence. And you know, if you take a snapshot of just one section of the fence, it looks just like this. It is two pillars with white canvas that runs in between it. It looks just like a Torah scroll. And that's why they say it is actually the Torah that is wrapping around. It is the fence. It is the commandments. It is the word of God protecting the heart that is in the Ark of the Covenant. The heart is the commandments, according to the scriptures. So when the sword of the Spirit comes up, and it opens up what's inside of us. It separates two sides. A fence is put in there. That's the, that's the fence that Yeshua is talking about. When he says, I did not come to make you feel good about yourselves. I did not come so that you can invite me into your little hearts and come up you know, and write a, fill out a little card, say this is when I got saved, you know, January 14th, 2000 and whatever. I didn't come so you can feel good. He says, I came to divide. I came to bring a plow. I came to separate. I came to bring my father's fence that the enemy keeps knocking down. And I came to bring it and build it back up. When the sword opens up the ground, it separates. A fence is put right down the middle. That fence, by the way, what is right in the middle? What, what do you put right in the middle once you plow it up? Seed. How interesting. What does Yeshua say in one of the parables? The four kinds of what? Seeds. What's it called? What's he say the seed is? The word of God. What's the word of God to a first century Jew? The Torah. What's he saying? If you get rid of the traditions and doctrines of men and you only have the word of God, it will raise up a fence to protect you. All right, we spent quite a bit of time talking about the last two letters, and, and we're, next week we're going to go into Chet and spend quite a bit more time uh, discovering what the letter Chet really means in the original language in the Paleo-Hebrew. I know I touched on it just a little bit tonight, but next week we're going to go into it far more depth, and then we'll finish up uh, these uh, set of letters here with the letter Tet uh, as well. All right, so make sure that you... Uh, you tune in uh, for that particular uh, broadcast. Father, thank you so much for this time together, and I pray that you would take us where we need to be. In Yeshua's name, amen. Join us as we travel back in time 4,000 years ago to discover exactly where the holidays of Christmas, Easter, and even Valentine's Day come from. Why do we celebrate the birth of Jesus on December 25th? Whose birthday really is on December 25th? Where did we come up with December 25th? Where did the star on top of the Christmas tree come from? Where did the Christmas tree itself come from? Where did St. Nicholas come from? Are we sure that St. Nicholas even existed? Have you ever wondered where the famous phrase, ho, 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 comes from? It comes from the late 1600s when they used to have plays and before the devil would come on stage, he would announce himself by saying, ho, ho, ho. Did you know that original Santa's elves weren't little guys that made toys, they were Krampus demons that would punish the children if they weren't good for that year, while St. Nicholas would give them gifts if they were good. Who is the Easter Bunny? Where do we get Easter eggs from? Why do we celebrate Easter on the first Sunday after the vernal equinox? 
Did you know that Christmas was illegal in the United States until the mid-1800s? Can we celebrate these holidays according to the Bible? This is by far the most popular video on the internet on the history of Christmas and Easter. This video has changed hundreds of thousands of people's lives and it will change your life too.